The Covenant Podcast exists to discuss doctrine, theology, and the biblical worldview from a covenantal Baptist perspective. We pray that this resource will be edifying to you and glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Jimmy and Austin here. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. As we've previously mentioned, CBTS exists to provide ministerial training in the context of a confessional local church. They are confessional, Baptist, affordable, and accessible. You can learn more about them at cbtseminary.org, cbtseminary.org. Head on over to their website or stay tuned for more information. Brother Jimmy, good to talk with you today. It is good to be on as usual. <laughs> uh, we previously had uh, this episode time uh, scheduled to record with Brandon Adams, so we want you to uh, stay tuned for a special episode with him in the coming episodes, but uh, he had an emergency today, so he was unable to record with us. So on short notice, Jimmy and I are going to be uh, recording today on the book of Hebrews. Uh, this is something that uh, I would say Brother Jimmy has been studying in depth for quite some time. Uh, actually, this week, the week that this episode is being released, Brother Jimmy is coming to preach at the first annual conference, Bible conference at my church at Shepherd Baptist Church in Dixon, Missouri. He's actually going to be preaching the first sermon. And he's going to be preaching an overview of the book of Hebrews. And uh, Brother Jimmy, you've been preaching through Hebrews a lot lately, haven't you? Yeah, I, let's see, I I finished probably about two months ago, but I, I it took me about 65 or so sermons to get through the book of Hebrews. It could have been much longer. When I started, I was moving much faster. Um, and then I slowed down a lot um, once I really got to chapter 8. So if I were to go back, I probably would have slowed down more in the beginning. I, I feel like I kind of rushed it. But that said, it took me well over a year to to get through the book of Hebrews. Yeah. How was that experience for you, preaching through this 13-chapter book in over a year? Well, I mean, being a young pastor with relatively little experience. Um, it was a intimidating task to preach through such a large book, but also it, it is a book that is understood by many to be fairly difficult to, to interpret as well as difficult to preach. And we'll, we'll get into some reasons why it, it is difficult to preach, especially in our context. But, um, can you remind me the question again? I lost my train of thought. How is this experience for you to preach through Hebrews? All right. So as I was saying, it was difficult, but also, I mean, just in the deep study of it and, and encountering the the supremacy of Christ and, and how he is a, a total redeemer and a, a, a full throttled savior, we might say. Um, was very encouraging to me, and also I just believe that it, it was encouraging to the folks at Vista Baptist Church to to re, be reminded week after week of our sufficient Savior. Uh, w with that said, let's talk about some background information to the book of Hebrews, maybe particularly uh, some things that the pastor would need to know before they prepare to preach an expositional series through the book of Hebrews. Uh, let's talk about the audience first. Who is the audience that the author of Hebrews is writing to? The audience, at least in my opinion from, from studying, is a, a group of Jewish Christians who are going through various hardships and, and quite likely being persecuted for their faith, um, though not losing their, their life for it at that point. And they are appear to be tempted to 
return to the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament um, and, and to participate in those, again, particularly temple worship and things of that nature, which, which kind, of, kind of leads me to conclude that it was written before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Otherwise, much of what is said in the book wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but it's, it's written to a group of Christian suffering or suffering Christians who, who are being reminded to keep trusting in Christ. Let's, let's talk about the title. Why is the book of Hebrews titled Hebrews? Well, I mean, it's written to a group of Hebrews. That, that seems to be the most plausible reason, as well as just the entire nature of the book is Hebraic, in the sense that there is a lot of references and allusions to the, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and, and realizing that Jesus is the, the prophesied Messiah of the Hebrew Scriptures. So that's one of many reasons. I mean, it, it's just a letter to the Hebrews. It's, it's written to a group of Hebrew Christians. I intentionally asked you an easier question to prepare yourself for this harder question. Who wrote Hebrews? <laughs> huh. Um... Well, there. This is a difficult question. It's it's difficult because I don't, I don't think I can give a definitive answer. Um, I can give some of the, the options that that I I read in my studies. Um, probably the most robust defense is that it is a a sermon, um, by Paul, that was recorded by he, by Luke. Um, and that explains some of the differences in languages and, and, and language as well as some of the, the word choice that is, that is used in the book of Hebrews that differs slightly from, from Paul's usage of those terms. And in the book of Hebrews, the terminology for, for perfection almost is synonymous with the terminology of justification in, in Paul's other, other books. But that's one, and that's put forward by David Allen, who, uh, who gives kind of the most robust defense for it. Um, historically, uh, the church has thought that it was written by Paul. I, however, am not entirely convinced by it, but I'm, I'm open to it. So here's, here's my best answer to the question. I really don't know who wrote it. It, it was someone carried along by the Holy Spirit, and, and I lean towards some form of Pauline inf influence, or, or he actually authored it. Good. Good answer. Um, so we've talked about author, audience, title, and we're going to get into the major theme of the book of Hebrews. But before we do so, uh, you mentioned that you preached 65 sermons through this meaty, deep book. Can you give our listeners, maybe pastors, uh, a word of encouragement of why they should preach through the book of Hebrews? Well, there are, there are a number of reasons. The first one is it's... It's a book of the Bible. It is scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is within the canon, and, and thus it is, it is profitable for teaching, for correction, and for reproof, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So that's, that's the first reason, but also just the supremacy of Christ and, and the opportunity basically every week just to, to preach how awesome our Savior is, is it was one of the most enjoyable experiences for me. And, and you don't really have to labor too much to, to see that point and make that point evident to your congregation to see how awesome of a Savior that we have. Another reason I think in our context that makes the book of Hebrews very important is, at least in my experience, the, the somewhat general um, aversion to or ignorance of the Old Testament. Um, the author of Hebrews quotes directly the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament 33 times and makes over 90 allusions to it. And when you have popular speakers and preachers saying that we need to disconnect our, our New Testament Christianity from the Old Testament, the author of Hebrews is, is shouting, no, 
<laughs> because because the Old Testament it, it points to Christ and helps us in many ways to understand the nature of Jesus's work as as it is highlighted in the various shadows of the Old Testament ceremonial system as well as in the prophetic pronouncements that that we find about Jesus in the Old Testament or or even typological pronouncements and the correlation between him and David as the greater David for example or or a better prophet than than Moses or a better priest than Aaron um, so it, it 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 highlights the supremacy of Christ by really showing how Christ is the the final word and the fulfillment of everything that was spoken of in the old. So if you want to introduce your people to the Old Testament and its ongoing relevance in the Christian life, Hebrews is an excellent an excellent place to start. So that's that's a number of reasons. That's one of the reasons or some of the reasons I want to preach through the book of Hebrews. And also I just wanted to better understand how the new covenant relates to to the old covenant so that studying Hebrews in depth can can give you some understanding and mastery over those subjects. Well, thank you for that. Uh, one thing that we really haven't hit on yet, which we intentionally put for this part of the episode, was the theme of Hebrews. Uh, Brother Jimmy, feel free to take this conversation wherever you want to, but what is the theme of the book of Hebrews? or at least the theme that you noticed while you preached through the book of Hebrews? I mean, it's a big book, so there there are, and it's a dense book. It's not just long compared to other epistles, but it's very dense, um, and, and the author assumes that his audience knows a lot um, of the background of the things that he is discussing. But With that said, I'd say the overarching big idea is trust God's Son, Jesus. It's over and over again. The author exhorts and encourages his audience, his original audience, as well as us, to trust in God's Son, Jesus. And and when I I preached through the book of Hebrews, I, I did two introductory sermons just because it's such such a long book and such a deep book and and I highlighted four things that that the book of G, or the book of Hebrews tells us about Jesus and that is the first one is trust God's son because he is first and and by first I mean I mean he's preeminent he he is the beginning he is the best he is superior to all things he he is said to be to be God himself, that, that he is the incarnate Son of God, that he is superior to angels. He's, he's said to be better a better high priest than Aaron, as well as all those who followed in Aaron's line. He, he is a better prophet than, than, than Moses, as well as he, he ushers the people of God into a better Canaan than the Canaan that, that Joshua led the people of God in the Old Testament into. So Jesus is first. He, he's also a priest of a, a better covenant, the new covenant. We Probably one of the, the largest expositions in Scripture of Jeremiah 31 on the new covenant comes from Hebrews chapter 8, and he also gets into it a little bit in Hebrews chapter 10 in, in talking about how the covenant that was established in Christ as both the mediator and and the federal head of, as well as the, the sacrifice of the new covenant, the covenant that he establishes is different and superior to the covenant that was established at Sinai, which is very important to, to the argument of the book, as well as it's, it's of great encouragement that the new covenant includes things that were not guaranteed in the old covenant. And though Old Testament saints were saved by grace through faith in Christ, those that salvation was not something that, that was guaranteed and accomplished by the Mosaic Covenant itself. Instead, it was accomplished by what the Mosaic Covenant served to bring about, and that is the birth of the Messiah that God had promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15. So, so Jesus is first in the sense that he is superior to all of God's revelation. It, it, it is, he is the final revelation, which leads to 
the second point that I highlighted, that we must trust in God's Son because He is final. Everything that was written in the Bible, everything that was revealed in the Bible about about the just about God's people, about God, about the sacrificial system, all all the things that are and details that are mentioned in the Old Testament, they they culminate in and they find their fulfillment in Christ. They are shadows that point to him. And there in that being the case that Jesus is final means that there's no revelation that will come after him. He is the final revelation of God, um, which which kind of spits in the face of some of the modern day cults that 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 argue for a continued revelation or the need for a new revelation, like the Book of Mormon or even the Quran. Jesus is the final revelation of God. There needs to be nothing after him. And those documents which define who he was and what he did and the covenant that he he established in in his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, there, there's no need for anything else because because he's it. It all leads up to him. Um, and I mean, people who read the Old Testament as something that that is irrelevant or or kind of disconnected from Christ um, have really missed the ball because Jesus reads the Old Testament as if it is about him, and so does the author of Hebrews. Um, so Jesus is final. And, and then in my second introduction that, that I gave on the book of Hebrews, I, I talk about two other aspects of Jesus and why we should trust him. Uh, this, this is the third point, trust God's son, Jesus, because he is fatal. And, and there are many somber and, and serious passages in the book of Hebrews particularly those passages often called the the apostasy passages. Chapter 3, chapter 6 um, are, are among those, probably the more difficult of them, um, talking about how those who reject God's Son um, will be damned, um, even if they, they, they at one point verbally professed faith, even if, if they, they even fellowshiped with God's people for a time, if, if they reject God's Son, particularly in their context, returning to the Jewish cult that Jesus had fulfilled, the shadows that pointed to Christ, if they return to the shadows, they forfeit that salvation that they had once claimed to have. And, and this is a very serious um, statement that, that the author of Hebrews makes over and over and over again. But what's interesting is in each one of those apostasy passages, he doesn't assume that his readers have actually committed this sin. He, he's using these, these warnings as a means to exhort them to persevere in the faith, because apart from Christ, there is no salvation. We, we must trust in him. And, and God uses these warnings by his spirit to, to encourage the Christian, to strengthen the Christian, to, to keep them in the faith, to preserve them, that they might persevere. Um, and then the final point is trust God's Son because he is faithful. And, and there are six things we, we could highlight about Jesus um, that, that signify that he is faithful and remind us that he is faithful that comes from the books of, book of Hebrews. Um, Jesus can sympathize with us. I mean, that's that's an encouraging thing. We learn that in Hebrews 4, verses 14, through all the way, really, chapter 5, verse 8, that he he can sympathize with us, that, that, that he knows what it means to live in a fallen world. He knows what it means to be tempted from without, because Jesus wasn't tempted from within, because he, he did not have a sin nature as we do, but he, he can sympathize with our temptation with the temptations that we experience in part, as well as with the sufferings that we experience. And he didn't succumb to them like we do. He, he, he experienced them, but without sin. And yet he can sympathize with us and we can draw near to the throne of grace through him.
also we we learn in the book of Hebrews that that God's promises don't fail that that what God has promised to do what he has promised to accomplish in his son it will come to pass because God doesn't lie um thirdly Jesus has completed his work and and the the repercussions and the effects of that work will eventually be fully realized Jesus was the founder and finisher of our faith. He, he did accomplish the, the work that was assigned to him in the covenant of redemption um, between God the Son and, and, and God the Father. He, he died as a substitute for his people, um, meriting to them the total forgiveness of their sins and, and, and presenting them to, to the Father as perfect saints. Um, also, God's discipline is, is a theme that, that rise up, and it's, it's set by the author as an evidence of God's faithfulness. God disciplines those he loves. Even Jesus, though he didn't experience corrective discipline, still experienced discipline from his Father to, to, to prove his, his status as, as the Messiah, to, to eventually ascend from from to the right hand of God, where he he now currently reigns, and eventually he will return and establish the new Jerusalem that that Abraham looked forward to as as he was navigating. And then also we learn that God's kingdom never ends, and and that that God's people, by the grace of God in Christ, live as citizens of that heavenly kingdom that I, they await. Um, so those are the four points, and that's a lot, and that obviously I'm going to unpack them at much greater length when I when I preach on them, and I, I believe the recordings of when I previous preached on them are, are on our church website, but really what we find in the book of Hebrews is just this over and over um, repetition that we must trust, we must rely on God's Son for our salvation, and we must never do anything other than rely on Him for our salvation. We must not leave Him for anything else that seeks to draw us away, no matter what God allows to come to us in our circumstances, whether they be sufferings or, or, or times of blessings. We must never forget that our Savior and our Redeemer is Jesus Christ. That's good. I'm looking forward to hearing you preach on these uh, points again at my conference in the coming weeks, but I do have a couple more questions for you before we sign off here today. Uh, I am a, I would say, first-year Greek student. I'm still working my way through First John, so still very introductory-level Greek mm -hmm. student. Uh, Jimmy has had much more study in Greek than I uh, if I had to guess, if I mentioned the term Septuagint in my church, the majority of people in my congregation probably wouldn't know what that is. Maybe some people in our audience don't know what the Septuagint is. Uh, can you tell us what the Septuagint is and how that relates to the book of Hebrews? In summary, the Septuagint is the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Um, now, there's debate about whether or not there was a one Septuagint or, or things of that nature. I don't feel the need to get into that right now. But essentially, it is, it is the Greek um, translation of the Old Testament. And the reason that would come up in a discussion of Hebrews is because oftentimes the author of Hebrews is quoting the, the Septuagint. And there are times where the Septuagint differs slightly from from the Hebrew Bible, at least the Hebrew Bible that we have um, currently, um, that is not to call into question the 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 faithfulness of of the Hebrew text we have now. It's just realizing that that the Masoretic text is the oldest copies that we have are are not even as old as the oldest copies of the Septuagint we have. But also um, the that said. The, the Hebrew Bible does have merit of being trustworthy because of the discovery of, of the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that do date um, 
way, way, way far back in antiquity. And, and the, the comparison of the Masoretic text that is used to translate our Hebrew Bibles now and the Dead Sea Scrolls, you come up with the same thing. Um, so you asked me about the Septuagint, though. Why, why does it matter? Um, because the author of Hebrews quotes it over and over again. But I mean, in most instances, the, the differences between the, the Masoretic text as well as the Greek Septuagint, at least in the book of Hebrews, are are very subtle and really communicate no substantially different doctrine or anything like that. So I don't know if that helps answer or what you were getting at, but <laughs> the Septuagint is just quoted over and over and over again. And and really it's quoted throughout the entirety of the New Testament several times. We've mentioned uh on previous episodes about covenant theology. And I know that whenever you uh, began to give me literature on covenant theology to study, you gave me uh, expositions of uh, the book of Hebrews, specifically chapter 8 by uh, Nehemiah Cox and uh, John Owen's work. Uh, So Mm -hmm. can you tell us what covenant theology is very briefly for the sake of time and why Hebrews chapter 8 is uh, important to the discussion of covenant theology. Well, for a more detailed um, explanation of covenant theology, I'd recommend going and, and listening to the episode episode by Brandon Adams that, that we recorded a while back, and, and Austin will link that in the show notes. He gives a more full definition, but covenant theology is is really the understanding of God's dealings with people by way of covenant, which which is a a formal um, relationship between both God and a federal representative. Um, and and there are better ways to define that. That's just off the top of my head right now. Um, but anyways, the reason Hebrews eight plays a a key part is because Hebrew 8, Hebrews eight is a a New Testament wholly inspired exposition of the teaching of Jeremiah thirty one, which is the the key Old Testament text in which the the new covenant is promised. Um, and and the author of Hebrews is essentially getting at that in the coming of Christ, that is the covenant which he. He is both the federal head of, but also the the mediator and the sacrifice and the priest of that covenant. And within covenant theology, there there are various streams of thought about how to understand how the covenants relate to each other. Um, The Westminster tradition, oftentimes the language of one covenant of grace with multiple administrations. Um, So each one of the Old Testament covenants following the covenant of works made with Adam are are the covenant of grace substantially, but they have different outward ordinances assigned to them, might be one way to put it. And I encourage you to actually read a Presbyterian, explain this, Um, go to a primary source and read it. Read someone like Calvin or um, Robertson has written a, a modern treatment called Christ of the Covenants in which, which he explains it. There, there are also others that, that do differ slightly, and, and I believe Michael Horton discusses this in his book on covenant theology. There, there is a stream that, that understands that the Mosaic Covenant is actually a republication of sorts in the covenant of the covenant of works. And even during the Westminster Conference, the there was disagreement among some about how to best understand the covenant. Some understood the Old Testament covenants, like the Mosaic covenant, to to serve a subservient um, function of bringing forth the covenant of grace, particularly the Messiah of the covenant of grace, but they weren't actually the, the covenant of grace itself. And the Baptist tradition... Um, uh, more popularly called nowadays 1689 federalism fits within the broader streamed of reformed covenant theology essentially asserting that 
that the covenant of grace is substantially different from those covenants that precede it. But those covenants that precede it were established always with the intent to bring about that covenant of grace that was initially promised in Genesis 3.15. So if, if we were to walk through the covenants, you have the covenant of works made with Adam, you have the, the promise of life signified by the tree, you have the, the promised curse if, if taking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and, and obviously he, he disobeyed and all of man fell in Adam, and all of creation fell as a result of, of Adam's sin. And within the curses that, that God was pronouncing, particularly to the serpent, he made a promise in Genesis 3.15 that there would be a seed of the woman that, that, that defeats the seed of the serpent, or that defeats the serpent. And then we begin to see God bringing about that promise, and, and we, we, we see the wretchedness of man expand after the covenant works had been broken. God brings about a flood, but still redeems a, a people out of sinful humanity, particularly Noah and his family. And, and God in the covenant made with Noah sets up parameters, promise to never destroy the world like that again. And, and, and Noah's offspring spread, and, and, and there's still wickedness in the world, but there's some governing principles set forth in, in the covenant with Noah to, in which God binds himself not to obliterate the earth in order to fulfill that, that, that promise that he, he made in Genesis 3.15. And then Genesis, the, the account of Genesis, slows down a lot when we get to Genesis 12, which is Abraham's narrative. And following from Genesis 12, you, you have a, a very slow unfolding of God's dealings, particularly with Abraham's family. And one of the blessings that is promised in the Abrahamic covenant is that there would be a seed through whom the nations would be blessed. And, and as you read various other aspects of this, you read Genesis 12, you read Genesis 15 and also Genesis 17, you, you begin to see some greater detail given to the nature of the seed, that there will be kings that, that come from Abraham that will, that will reign. And eventually, this, this seed of Abraham, it, it gets limited to through a particular child of, of Abraham named Isaac, and then it gets limited further through, through Jacob. And then Eventually, it gets limited even further to Judah in, in the Davidic covenant. Or, well, it gets limited to Judah initially through a promise that was made by Joseph, but it was limited to David's line, particularly in the Davidic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant kind of builds off of the back of the, the Abrahamic covenant in which God establishes a physical nation made up of, of, of a various tribes, of 12 tribes that, that live in a covenantal relationship of God in which God sustains them based upon their conditions to keep the, both the, the moral law but also the positive laws of the covenant with Moses. Um, but God is still bringing forth that promise in which he, he sustains them even when they are exiled for disobedience. He, he still brings about this promised seed. And then, and then we read in the Luke account of the, the, um, the genealogy of Christ that he is indeed the son of Eve, that he is the, the son of Abraham, that he is the son of David, that he is the Messiah that was foretold that he is the one who brings about this covenant. And, and back to Genesis, or back to Hebrews 8, um, Hebrews 8 gives us detail about how the, the new covenant is a better covenant, not only in degree, but actually in kind, than the covenant that was made at Sinai. I mean, you, you look at verse 7 of chapter 8, or rather, let me go up a little bit. Beginning in verse 5, he says, They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, talking about the tabernacle, he instructed by God, saying, 
See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as is Christ has obtained a ministry it, that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he meditates is, or mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So it is a better covenant because it is enacted on better promises. And those promises include the total forgiveness of sin. They, they include regeneration, the writing of God's laws upon their heart, and not only stone. It is substantially a better covenant. Um, so that was a very roundabout way to answer why Hebrews 8 is important to covenant theology and what covenant theology is. So did I answer your question? In full, brother, in full. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, the last question I have today as we get ready to wrap up is, uh, what commentaries did you use whenever you preached through the book of Hebrews, and what resources would you recommend for someone that wants to preach through this book? I used, there, there were several, I, I used Spurgeon, or the, the commentary series that Logos provides, or Lexham Publisher provides, they, they have various expositions by Spurgeon. I used that on Hebrews. I also used a commentary by a particular Baptist named James Haldane, and actually that one was a was incomplete. He, he didn't actually get to finish his exposition. It's an outline set up for an exposition, but there's a lot of rich content in there. I also used uh, John Owen and his commentary on the book of Hebrews. It, it's very long, so I didn't always use it every week or I didn't read it in full. Um, but when I got to particularly difficult text uh, uh, and, and when I got to other parts in the book of Hebrews, like Hebrews chapter 8, I consulted John Owen. I also like to use John Gill in, in most, most times. Donald Guthrie, I believe, I want to say. Let me look this up. I don't want to get his name wrong. It's the Tyndale Commentary. Let me see here. This is why I recommend Lagos. I can just look up stuff real quick. Let's see here. There it is. Yes, Hebrews by Donald Guthrie. That was a helpful one in the Tyndale commentary. And then I also used Tom Schreiner's commentary on the book of Hebrews. So those were some of the main ones. Also, I mean, in regards to covenant theology, I'd recommend Samuel Renion's new book, The Mystery of Christ, His Kingdom, and His Covenant the the combined volume from Adam to Christ of Nehemiah Cox's expositions of the covenants as well as John Owen's exposition of the book of Hebrews. And you might have some other books to recommend on covenant theology, but those are two of the ones that I found most helpful. Well, this has been a good conversation, uh, Brother Jimmy. Uh, Hopefully, this will serve as a good resource to anyone that is thinking about preaching through the book of Hebrews or just wants to study the book of Hebrews or wants to know the content of God's inspired word within this book deeper. So thank you for uh, taking your time to study or uh, give us an explanation of this book here today, brother. No problem. I enjoyed doing it. Well, as we previously mentioned, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. CBTS exists to provide ministerial training in the context of a confessional local church. They are confessional, Baptist, affordable, accessible, and accredited. Learn more about CBTS at cbtseminary.org, cbtseminary.org. Grace and peace. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. If you've enjoyed this resource or you simply like the Covenant podcast, head on over to our iTunes page, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are also available via Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and Podbean. Thank you for listening to the Covenant podcast. Grace and peace to you.